Good evening, folks. Ken Hovind here in the crew at Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. It is March the 12th, 2019. Thank you for joining us. We're the folks who believe the Bible is true and the evolution theory is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of the earth. And tonight, we shoot the sacred cow. <laughs> If you'd like to come down and bring a group to visit Dinosaur Adventureland, people come visit all the time. Uh, it's amazing. Give tours on the four-wheeler, and most of them want the real tour instead of the grandma tour. That's good. <laughs> yeah, the grandma tour is a little dull. The real tour is, whoa. Did we ever find that phone that lost it? Who about that kid that got lost? He bounced out of the mule? Did they, did they never? Nobody bounced out of the mule. You evolution has calmed down, okay? Oh, we're sure. We like Okay, April 20th is our anniversary, one year of being open. We are getting a lot done. Can you believe all the progress in the last couple of days? Man, it's looking good. We're nowhere near done yet, but come on down, help us out. Uh, testimony time. If any of you new folks, Johnny is here. Is he not in here? Does he know it's 715? The new guy, uh, check the man cave, see if he knows 715. He just sh showed up an hour ago. Oh, I bet he doesn't. He doesn't know, yeah, 715. Brother, did you ever want to share a testimony and tell folks about our, how you heard about our ministry and your family? Okay, come on up. Tell them who you are and what you think about the place, and your kids are having a blast here, I believe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. So tell them a little bit about who you are and how you heard about us and what you're doing here. You showed up, we put you to work. So my name is Michael Ledee. Came here with my wife and our four children. Um, I've known about Ken Hova's ministry for quite a while. He's actually very instrumental in myself becoming a Christian. Can you see him on screen? No. Fix it where you can. There. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I've, I've followed Kent Hovind's ministry for quite a while. Um, he was very instrumental in myself becoming a Christian. Just a little bit briefly about my history. Both my parents are Catholic, and um, they really didn't teach me much about the Bible growing up. I really didn't know much of anything beyond Christmas and Easter. And stuff I was learning in school, in high school, and college, I took classes on anthropology, biology. All these things just, it contradicted a little bit. I didn't know about the Bible. I'd ask my parents questions, I'd ask priests questions. How do you how do you um how, how how do you relate these things? How do you relate evolution to the Bible? And they, nobody can answer my questions. So for years, I just used that as fuel for me to just reject the Bible. And um I could not answer these I could not find these uh, answers to these questions. So for whatever reason, when Passion of Christ came out, I went to watch that movie. And when I saw that movie, I've never actually heard the words of Jesus ever. And just leaving that movie, I don't think I was a believer at that point, but it just, it kind of gave me more, I, I wanted to learn more about the Bible, I wanted to learn more, learn more about Christianity. Um, so I would watch Bible, I would watch church at home on Sundays, and then I saw at the end of this church service I was watching, they were talking about this excavation they found in Glen Rose, Texas, where they unearthed, about 100 years ago or so, a huge layer of limestone that had dinosaur footprints and human footprints in the same layer of limestone, which pretty much just blows the whole evolutionary theory out the water. Um, so that kind of sparked my interest. I started to learn more, more, learn more about creation science, and I just for years I just I just dove into that. Um, found Ken Holman's ministry. This is probably around 07, 08, um, and just followed him for a real long time. He's been really instrumental for myself, uh, for my family, uh, just just my Christian walk in general. I had an opportunity to teach high school science for a year in a, in a Christian setting, and I used a lot of his material to teach these kids. I had to teach out of regular secular high school books on biology and um, earth science and that kind of stuff. So I would I would teach the stuff in the high school books, and then I would parallel it with a lot of his teachings to kind of teach both theories side by side, so that way the kids can decide what they want to believe. But I mean, during that year I was there, I saw a lot of growth. I saw a lot of kids actually sitting there and for the first time analyzing their their worldview. And um, and actually helped a lot of them to just um, have a lot more solid foundation on their faith. So it's been a blessing to me, and it's been a, it's been a blessing for us to be here and be a part of this. And we're glad to be here, been having a great time. Hey, so, amen. Thank you. Been here a couple of days and did quite yeah. a few projects for yeah, us. Yeah, got more to do tomorrow. Court, yeah, so, amen. Thank yep. you, brother. Thank Come you. and the kids are they enjoying it? They're having a blast. Having a blast. You guys like it? Your twins are seven. All right. Yeah, I enjoy giving them a hard time, giving them a ride on the mule. Thank you for joining us here. Uh, boot camp coming up June 14, 15, 16, Friday night, all day Saturday and Sunday morning. If you want to come join us for a boot camp, call Rhonda. Let her know you're interested. Motorhome hookup spots are going to be gone quickly if you want to hook a motorhome. But if you want to just come put up a tent, that's no problem. Put up, we got 140 acres. Put up a tent up under the stars where you want on the top of the sand dune. That would be cool. Yeah. If you'd like to help us, oh, the speakers, uh, Dennis Swift, Paul Abramson, Don Boys, Richard Reeves are uh, speaking uh, so far. If you'd like to drive the bus down, several people have said they would be interested. Don't don't call me. Call uh, the folks in. Call Bob in Massachusetts, and say I would like to drive the bus down. 
Paul, did you find out they don't need a special license? Yeah, we have a guy that's going to bring it down. Oh, somebody's going to bring it down. Okay. Yep. It's already taken care of. Don't need a license. Don't need a license because there's no passengers. Just a personal bus. Okay. Don't even need to know how to see your driver or anything. Right. <laughs> Just try to, try to keep it between the ditches and keep the rubber side down. That's important. Okay. The emus uh, are coming. Now we just need the money to pay for them. Uh, so if you'd like to help with that, we don't know when they're, I got a call and find out when are they going to show up. How close are you on the fence, Rich? You've been welding like crazy? Uh, day and a half, two days. Another day and a half, two days. Okay. If you'd like to help support our ministry, the 777 Club, we'd appreciate it if you join that. We ask folks, we don't, we don't ever, we don't never get a dunning letter from us ever. We don't check up on that. But if you'd like to, go to drdino.com to the donate page and make any checks to CSE. We're asking folks to give a dollar a day. Uh, last night, we left off talking about the first law of thermodynamics and how the evolution theory do directly violates that. Matter simply cannot be created or destroyed. So where did the universe come from? The textbooks are going to tell you it came from a big bang where nothing exploded, which makes absolutely no sense to anybody on the planet. Nothing exploded and made everything. You've got to be kidding. But if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it, and that's what's happened. Now, a sacred cow, an idea, custom, or institution held especially unreasonably to be above criticism. The Hindus respect for the cow as a sacred animal. Oh my gosh. The sacred cow. <laughs> they worship them, they pray to them, oh cow, would you please give me a new car? I'm serious. And believe it or not, they think it helps them to be healthy if they drink the cow's urine. Okay? I am dead serious. In religious rituals, Hinduism, cow urine has a special significance as a medicinal drink. Sprinkling of cow urine is said to have spiritual cleansing effect as well. Don't knock it they, until you try it. <laughs> they even market it. They, <laughs> they market it to replace to replace Coca-Cola. They think the Western drink of Coca-Cola is destroying their country, so drink cow pee instead. Okay. Today it's time the sacred cow of evolutionists. We're going to kill it today. Okay. The sacred cow of evolution is time, Steve. The sacred cow is time. Billions and billions of years. Somehow, in their little brain, billions of years can accomplish the impossible. Well, how did that happen? Well, I'll give it enough time. First of all, time won't help, okay? But tonight we're going to talk about time. How do they come up with these numbers? How do they measure the age of the universe? Protests erupt across India amid growing anger over the beef lynchings by vigilante cow protection mobs. When you shoot the sacred cow, these folks get angry. Babies will scream if you take their pacifier out. Evolutionists will scream if you take away time. That's their pacifier. Somehow, time can accomplish the impossible. See, if I told you if you kiss a frog, it would turn to a prince. You'd say, come on, that's a fairy tale. But somehow, what if we give the frog billions of years? Yes, boys and girls, we started off as an amoeba. Slowly, slowly, very slowly became a frog. And then very slowly became a prince. It's the same fairy tale with a new magic ingredient. See, if the frog turns to the prince quickly, we call it a fairy tale. But if the frog turns to the prince slowly, we call that modern science. That's their sacred cow right here. Billions and billions of years. Tonight, we shoot the sacred cow. <laughs> May take a while. How old is the universe and the earth? How old are they really? The Bible says clearly in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So God is claiming he did it. Okay. For by him, talking about Jesus, were all things created. By the way, that's one of dozens of verses that proves Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. I don't understand it, but the Bible teaches it. Okay. I don't have to understand gravity to use it, by the way. I'm using it right now. I've been using it all my life. And I don't understand it, but the Bible clearly teaches Jesus is God. And it's Jesus created everything in heaven and in earth. Hmm. So here we have a conflict. God is claiming that he did it. And Jesus said, and answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Oh, now here we... Can you give me one of the laminated timelines, would you? The charts, placemats. Uh, Jesus claimed that that was the beginning when he made them male and female. And by the way, it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. 
you got to say that these days. Uh, Mark 10, 6, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Not only was it the beginning, it was the beginning of the creation. So the Bible could not be more clear that that was the beginning. At least that's what Jesus said about it. In Romans 5, it says, by one man, sin came into the world and death by sin. Why do we have death and suffering in the world today? Well, the Bible says it's because of man's sin. First Corinthians, by man came death. In Adam all die. And Adam's sin also affected the plants and animals. Cursed be the ground for thy sake. Thorns and thistles. It wasn't just man. I was in the debate with Cy Gart, what, a couple days ago, a week ago, and he said, well, it only affected man. No, it didn't. It affected everything. The whole creation was affected by that. The Bible says clearly that Adam was the first man, and Eve is the mother of all living. And Adam lived 130 years and had a son and named him Seth. Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. So if you graph it out like I did on my chart here, Adam's 130 when Seth is born, and he lives 800 years after that. I made this graph years ago and said, wait a minute. If you add up the dates that are given in the Bible, it could not be more clear. That book is teaching the world was created about 4000 B.C. Now, I'm not one of those guys that puts an exact date on it and says it was 4004 B.C., October 23rd at 2 in the afternoon. I don't think you can get that close, okay? I do think Adam was made in the afternoon because it was just before Eve. And I think I figured out why God made Adam first. It's because he didn't want any advice on how to do it. I can see it now. No, God, you're doing it wrong. Eve, go stand over there. I can handle this, okay? Now, almost all the new textbooks, instead of calling it B.C., before Christ, they've changed it. Watch them. It's B.C.E., before the Common Era. They don't want kids thinking about Christ at all. Before Christ, who's Christ? Oh, it's Christ. Yeah, okay. Anyway, the textbooks clearly teach the earth is billions and billions of years old. This is the sacred cow. This is the magic ingredient to turn your frog to a prince. So Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning, which means we got a problem here. Was he lying? Was he stupid? Did he not understand science? Or could he have been right? When was the beginning? Thou, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, Hebrews 1.10. Okay, just today I went on the internet. How do scientists measure the age of the universe? Hmm. Knowing the current speeds and distances to galaxies, coupled with the rate at which the universe is accelerating, allows us to calculate how long it took for them to reach their current locations. What did they just say? They're looking at how fast the stars are going and how far away they are and saying, oh, they must have started right here 13.725 billion years ago or whatever number they're using today. Don't you see a couple of assumptions just right off the bat in that? How do you know they all started in one spot? They're assuming they started from this little spot and took off. They're assuming the, the rate of, of they're, assuming, they're assuming they can measure the distance accurately and measure the rate they're going accurately and that the rate's always been the same. All sorts of assumptions in that. In an honest court of law, if there is one, any lawyer could pick that apart and say, guys, you can't know that stars of 13.7 billion light years away. Come on. How do we measure the age of the universe? Astronomers estimate the age of the universe two ways. By looking for the oldest stars. Do they have a date on them? Do they have a license plate? How do you know, how, what do you know the age? <laughs> By measuring the rate of expansion of the universe. There we go again. The speed of light. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. By uh, measuring the rate of expansion of the universe and extrapolating back to the Big Bang. That is assuming the Big Bang happened. Just as crime detectives can trace the origin of a bullet from holes in the wall. Now that I would agree with. But the former I would not agree with. That's not science. How can we see stars that are billions of light years away if the universe is indeed only 6,000 years old, like the Bible clearly teaches? In the debate, the guy said, you believe the earth is only 6,000? I said, only? 6,000 is a long time. It's hard to remember 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Abe Lincoln was president 150 years ago. That's a long time. Columbus was running around trying to find this place 500 years ago. That's a long time. The Vikings were going around beating up on folks a thousand years ago. 6,000 is a really long time. Billions is beyond the human brain to comprehend. And that's what they count on. Let's get this, the theory of cognitive dissonance. Oh, too far. I can't think about it. Must be true. Oh, okay. 
Well, let's look at the stars for a second, the galaxies, because this is how they determine the age of the universe. This is how they get this billions of years to make your kid believe in evolution. The Bible says God made the heaven and the heaven of heavens. God is claiming in Nehemiah chapter 9 that God did it. God claims he made everything. Supernova, that's a ring that's for a star has exploded, are relatively rare events occurring on average about once every 50 years in the Milky Way. Observations of dis distant galaxies allowing supernova to be discovered and examined more frequently. The first supernova detection patrol was begun in 1933. Probably some government job to sit around and watch the stars hoping one of them explodes. Problem is, the last one they observed was in 1600s, 400 years ago. Astronomers reckon there have been only three or four completely reliable observations of supernova in our galaxy. The most reliable observations of those are those of the years 15, 10, 1054, 1572, and 1604. Here is a nice summary which suggests the reliable observations could be as high as eight. So they might have seen eight supernovae in our galaxy, but only three or four that are reliable. Now, astronomers believe that about every 50 years a star dies or blows up or explodes in a supernova in our galaxy. If the Milky Way is billions of years old, why are there so few? Only three. Think about that for a couple minutes. There should be hundreds, several hundred million of them. There's a lot of stars just in our galaxy, you know. Are the stars wrong or is the theory wrong? Hmm. Access today. How many supernovas have been observed? Using telescopes, more than 10,000 have been observed in other galaxies. But I will limit my answer mainly to our own Milky Way. Strangely enough, none have been observed in our galaxy since the use of telescopes in astronomy. Read this carefully. So they have all been naked eye objects. Humans have only, humans have only about a couple of thousand year history of recording these events, and some accounts are unreliable. Astronomers reckon there have been only three or four completely reliable observations of supernovae in our galaxy. The most reliable observations are 1054, 1572, and 1602. You're telling me you can look at a galaxy, which is really a, a different galaxy, not ours, but a different one, way, way out there, and see a star exploding. Now, how exactly are they doing this? Well, they're seeing a spot get brighter and saying, oh, look at that, a star exploded. May be true. It may be true. I'm not saying it's not, but it's really flimsy evidence to convict somebody on. Could it be that there's a dust cloud clearing in front of it and the star was already bright behind it? Could it be the two stars came into a line and said, oh wow, bright spot, and it's actually two lined up close to each other? There are other explanations for this, Your Honor. He did not prove there was a star exploding, especially 10,000 of them. But even then, if the universe is billions of years old and one goes every 50 years, this would only be 500,000 years old. Think about it. One explodes it. Okay, so the galaxies do not show any great age for the Earth. If stars evolve, star births should equal star deaths. Or actually, they should exceed them. Novas and supernovas are star deaths. That's going the wrong way. Many have been observed. Where's the evidence for the star births, guys? In the, if uh, 76 trillion stars visible from Earth is the current estimate, if the universe is 20 billion years old, or 10 billion years old, or 13.7259865, whatever they're using now for a number, there should be 6 to 9 million new stars forming every minute. None have been observed to form. If stars evolve, star births should equal star deaths. There are no examples of anybody observing a star birth. Hmm. Think about that for five minutes. Okay. Star baby. They say, oh, a star, Alamogordo, New Mexico, at the, uh, when I was there, they said, oh, look at this, a star is being born. You don't know that. The silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is we do not know how a single one of these stars managed to form. They don't know. No one has unambiguously observed material falling into an embryonic star, which should be happening if the star is truly still forming. And no one has caught a molecular cloud in the act of collapsing. Well, that's back in 19... 90, I didn't know back then. How about in precisely how a section of an interstellar cloud collapses gravitationally into a star, a double or multiple star, 
or a solar system is still a challenging theoretical problem. Astronomers have yet to find an interstellar cloud in the actual process of collapse. Why would a dust cloud collapse into a solid? It's not even theoretically possible, I don't believe. Certainly not observable. Nobody's ever seen that. The origin of stars represents one of the most fundamental unsolved problems of contemporary astrophysics. No one really understands how star formation proceeds. It's really remarkable. Hmm. Stars blowing up is the opposite. The Bible says that he made the stars also. Just a couple of words. He made the universe, he made Adam and Eve, made everything, he just made the stars, like no big deal. The Bible says he counts the number of the stars and gives names to all of them. Seventy sextillion of them. You know, million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, sextillion, that's a lot of stars. Praise him, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. We, I think we should praise God. It says he laid the beams of his chamber in the waters. That's another story we'll get into later when we get into the Garden of Eden. What was it like? But The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The Lord is upon many waters, Psalm 29. Maybe everything that we see in the universe, all those stars, might all just be in one of these little glass balls on God's dresser. That he picks up and shakes once in a while. Hey, straighten up in there. You, Hoven, knock it off. Yes, sir, Lord, okay. <laughs> yes, sir. There's a lot of stars out there. Every individual could own 11 trillion of them. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. So they put the Hubble telescope up there and started zooming in, trying to find out how many stars are there. They look at a dot, a 30th the size of a full moon, or about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. They stared at that spot for 10 straight days, said, man, there are more stars in that spot than we can count. Why can't people just say, wow, what a mighty God we serve? Why is that so complicated? <sighs> stars are so far away, they appear to be just pinpoints of light. We cannot see their size or shape. So how do we tell different types of stars apart? For the vast majority of stars, the only characteristic we can observe is the color of their light. These things are really far away. Now, I taught trig for years. I'll give you a simple trigonometry lesson here. How do they measure the distance to the stars? Well, if you want to measure the distance to an object you cannot possibly touch, you know, across the ocean or up in the sky or something, you get two observation points and you measure this angle between, oh, avalanche, okay, between the object you're looking at and the other guy who's looking at the same thing. You get this angle, and you know the distance here. It's easy to measure the distance between your two observation points, and it's easy to measure the angle. Now you can calculate the unknown distance out there, sine, cosine, tangent, simple high school trig. Problem is, Earth is only 8,000 miles in diameter. So the furthest you could get away from somebody on Earth is 8,000 miles. I don't know what the opposite side of the world from Lenox, Alabama is. I don't know. Right, see. Lenox, Alabama. Opposite side of the world is probably about 31 degrees south latitude, someplace in the ocean out here in the Indian Ocean. Okay? So if somebody was in the Indian Ocean and we're in Lenox, Alabama, we're both looking at the star, we're only 8,000 miles apart through the Earth. So what they've done to enlarge the base of the triangle, let's look at the star in, uh, since Earth is 93 million miles from the Sun, they look at the star in June, uh, January, and then look at it in June, and now we have a bigger triangle. 16 light minutes. It takes light eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth. So our triangle now has a base of 16 light minutes. Whoa! 186 million miles. That's still nothing for star distance. One light year, one year, has over half a million minutes in it. 525,948 minutes in a year. So if we're going to make a triangle to measure one light year, one light year, we got Earth's orbit around the sun, 16 light minutes across. One light year is 525,000 inches away, if we change, these light, change it all to inches. 16 inches, 525,000 inches. That's uh, eight and a third miles. You've used transits and telescopes, have you, brother? Okay. Do you think two guys could park each other 16 inches, park their telescope 16 inches apart, look at a dot eight and a third miles away, and tell the distance to the dot. They don't know it's eight and a third miles, okay? All they know is they're 16 inches apart. How far out of parallel are their telescopes? It's a, real skinny triangle. a real skinny triangle, like real skinny. And I'm not sure you can tell exactly where you were six months ago, since the Earth is spinning and going around the sun, and the sun is going around the galaxy. 
like 1.2 million miles an hour. You're trying to take a measurement off of a moving object that's moving really fast. But I'll give them that. I'm, that's, throw that. I want to reserve that for appeal, Your Honor, in case they do come up with something. But I don't think you know exactly where you were six months ago. Earth's orbit around the sun is 16 light minutes in diameter. A year is 525,000 minutes. That makes an angle of 0 0.01 degrees. You want to measure 100 light years? Now you got a real skinny triangle. Keep in mind, these guys are 16 inches apart. They don't know how far away that third dot is. They're trying to tell me. And all they know is how far out of parallel are their telescopes. I'm not buying it. I'm not, I don't think you can measure that far, but I won't argue about 100. But to measure 100 light years is like having two guys on the roof up here in Pensacola, down in Pensacola, Florida, looking at a dot in Chicago, 830 miles away, and trying to calculate the distance to the dot, and all they have is how far out of parallel are their telescopes. That's a royal stretch. You want to measure 15 billion light years? I really am not going to believe that. Limitations of distance measurement using stellar parallax. 0 0.01 arc second are very difficult to measure from Earth because of the effects of Earth's atmosphere. Now there's something else to throw into the mix. Atmospheric twinkle going to disturb things. This limits based Earth-based telescopes to measure the distance about 100 parsecs away. Want to hold it. A parsec is 3.26 years, light years. So they're saying they can measure 326 light years. Okay, that's still way less than billions, isn't it? 300 is way less than a billion. Congress has no idea about how that works, but a billion's a lot, guys, okay? Quit spending it, okay? Uh, so they're trying to hit, tell me, they you know, the distance to these stars, how else are you going to measure it? Parallax trigonometry can be used up to 100 light years, this textbook says. Okay, I'll give them 300. I'll give them 1,000 if they quit crying. The fact is, you can't measure billions. This article said, This accuracy will enable SIM to determine stellar distances to 10% accuracy out to a distance of 482,000 million million miles. That's 82,000 light years. They're telling me now they can measure 82,000 light years. I doubt that, okay, but that's still less than billions. Why are they telling us the universe is 13 billion years old when they can't even measure 100,000? They now are saying they can measure most of the way across our galaxy, and we're in it. They can only measure 82% of the distance across our galaxy that we're sitting in. What a mighty God we serve. What an awesome universe. Okay, universe might be bigger and older than expected. The project aimed at creating an easier way to measure cosmic distances. Well, instead of turned a surprise that our large and ancient universe might be even bigger and older than they thought. If accurate, the finding would be difficult to mesh with current thinking about how the universe evolved, one scientist said. The team was led by some folks here who said, it's actually 15% further away than we calculated. You mean all this time we've had a 15% error? I think it may be more than that. The finding, which will be detailed in an upcoming issue of Astrophysical Journal, suggests the Hubble constant is not actually a constant. Could be off by 15%. You can read this article when you or read, hit pause and read it on your own. Scientists estimate the universe is 13.7 billion years old, a figure that has seemed firm since 2003. They change the number all the time. Watch this now. Based on measurements of radiation left over from the Big Bang, how did they measure 13 billion? Radiation left over from the Big Bang. Whoa. And about 156 billion light years wide. Hold on, stop the music, think for a minute. If the Big Bang was 13.7 billion years ago, how did those stars get 156 billion light years away? Wouldn't they have to be moving like 11 times faster than the speed of light? How can you get a universe, this one says 180 billion light years across? Stop. If it's 180 billion light years across, but the Big Bang took 13 billion years, took place 13 billion years ago, those stars had to move 11 times faster than the speed of light to get there, didn't they? Think about that for five minutes. 
a new way to measure distance. They have a new method they invented to calculate intergalactic distances. Okay, we wanted an independent measure of distance, he says. It took them 10 years to develop it on a government grant where they worked as slow as they could because they got paid when they got done. No, I'm sorry. Uh, they measured the distance to M33. Unlike single stars, the masses of paired stars can be precisely calculated based on their movements. You can see two stars moving around and you can calculate the mass through a telescope. And these things are, I forget how far M33 is, 50 million light years or something away. And you're going to tell me how much the star weighs or the mass. With knowledge of the star's mass, the researchers could calculate their true luminosity. Oh, so now they know how true it, how bright it really is. They're actually measuring this by how bright the star is. The difference between true luminosity and observed luminosity gives the distance between stars and Earth. So what are they doing? Why are they telling our kids in school the universe is 13.7 billion light years, or is billion years old? Because of the distance to the stars. And yet, if it's 180 billion light years across, that can't be true. It's off by a factor of 11 times. Huh. Lawrence Krauss, professor of astronomy, chair of the Department of Physics at Case Western Reserve, was not involved. He, has, he said the idea of a significantly reduced Hubble constant would be hard to accommodate. He said, we're pretty happy with what we've had for the long time here now. It would be hard, though not impossible, to change things by 15%. It's extremely important to have independent measurements of the Hubble constant. I would agree with that. We should double check all this stuff. And even then, go back and search the underlying assumptions that they're going on. What if the speed of light has changed? Whoa, that would upset everything. Everything. I'll show you in a minute. Here's some things to consider about the starlight. Scientists cannot measure distances beyond a few hundred light years. No one knows what light is. We don't know that it's always going the same speed through time, space, or matter. We know it can be slowed down. The whole idea behind a black hole is that light can be slowed down. That's the theory behind a black hole. Back in 1999, Houston Chronicle ran an article and said at Harvard they slowed light down to 38 miles an hour. Well, if you can slow it down, how can you use this as a measurement? Then the next year they slowed it down to one mile an hour. Hmm. Scientists bring light to a full stop, hold it, then send it on its way. Researchers say they've slowed light to a dead stop. Okay, is the speed of light a constant? The research was done at Harvard and Smithsonian and Cambridge. Physics, physicists briefly freeze pulse of light. We have succeeded in holding a light pulse still. Now think what this means for your star distance and your measurement and your age of the universe. Remember at the beginning, they tell the age of the universe by the distance to the stars. Scientists claim they've broken the ultimate speed barrier, the speed of light. They speeded light up to 300 times the speed of light. Well, if light can be slowed down or speeded up, how can we use this as a measure? Isn't this a rubber ruler? How long is that board? Well, how long would you like it to be? We'll make it anything you want. 300 times the speed of light. During the last 300 years, 164 separate measurements of the speed of light have been published. 16 different techniques were used. The speed of light has apparently decreased so rapidly, experimental error cannot explain it. Scientists think the speed of light has slowed, and they're trying to prove it. Accessed today, article published in 2016. Here's a chart showing the speed of light as it was measured for the last couple hundred years. The light seemed to have slowed down until about the early 1960s or late 50s. And now it's pretty steady, 186,282 something miles per second. In 1956, they invented the atomic clock. With the atomic clock, they defined the second as 9,192,000,000 cycles of cesium atom at zero magnetic field. So the second was defined as a fraction of the year 1900. Hold it, hold it. You're using an atomic clock as the base of your time, a, sec a second. So if light is slowing down, is your clock also slowing down? Now you really have a rubber ruler problem here. How could you measure the speed of light? The speed of light was 10 billion times faster at time zero? Really? No physical law prevents anything from exceeding the speed of light. In two published experiments back in 88 and 95, 
the speed of light was apparently exceeded by as much as a factor of 100. So the Big Bang Theory, which they're telling us is 13.7 billion years ago, I think has some serious problems, Your Honor. You don't know the speed of lights remain constant. You can't measure those distances. A shocking possibility is that the speed of light might change in time during the life of the universe. Really? Speed of light may have changed over history, study says. Nothing's reliable, not even the speed of light. We have shown how a time-varying speed of light could provide a solution, resolution to the well-known cosmological puzzles. Really? One mystery that it, the decaying speed of light, seems to be able to explain is why opposite extremes of the cosmos are too far apart to have ever been in contact with each other. Oh, so that's why they're 180 billion light years across. It would only be possible for light to cross from one side to the other if it traveled much faster than today, moments after the universe was created. Oh, so at creation, light went faster, and now it has slowed down. This is what they're trying to tell the kids. The hypothesis says it was so fast, it was traveling 186,000 miles a second, multiplied by a figure with 70 zeros after it. Whoa, now that's fast. Inconsistent speed of light may debunk Einstein. The speed of light may not be a constant. You can read that article if you like. Hit pause. The speed of light may change. Interesting. The speed of light of the cosmos is being questioned. I agree. That Paul Davies suggests the speed of light may have slowed over time. It could require a complete revision or maybe an abandonment of the inflationary hypothesis. Oh, so maybe the Big Bang isn't true. Well, I would think that which should be looked at, Your Honor. The inflationary hypothesis is the idea the universe has been expanding since it began with the Big Bang. Maybe we need to look at that. How about Discover Magazine? Was Einstein wrong about the speed of light? There's a book faster than the speed of light up here on the shelf if you want to read that. Articles have been published for decades on this topic. Is the speed of light a constant? And the answer is no. The speed of light, one of the most sacrosanct of the physical constants, may have been lower as recently as two billion years ago. Not in some far corner of the universe, but right here on Earth. New scientist, ah. Researchers in Switzerland succeeded in breaking the cosmic speed limit by getting light to go faster than, well, light. Scientists and his team have made light go backward. That was an interesting article. Researchers say the experiment made light appear to exceed its theoretical speed limit. Light travels backward and faster than light. We sent a pulse through an optic fiber and before its peak even entered the fiber, it was exiting the other end, actually moving backward. As the pulse entered the material, a second pulse appeared on the far end and flowed backward. Oh, here's some things to consider. God said he made a mature creation. It was done. Adam and Eve were full grown. Jesus made wine out of grapes that never existed, you know, aged in time that never was. Uh, how old was Adam when God made him? Zero. How old did he look? 66, the perfect age. God didn't make two babies and put them in the garden and give them a package of seeds and say, plant these quick, man, you're going to need a supper, you know. No. It has to be a full-grown man, full-grown woman, fully formed creation. Adam even had his com computer already programmed. He could walk, talk, name the animals, and get married first day. Where did he learn to walk? Where did he learn to talk? Had to be, it's not going to work any other way. Number four, a light year is a distance, it is not a time. The speed of light is not proven to be constant, so why would star distance have anything to do with the age of the universe? I like this quote here. How do scientists measure the age of stars? We can find the absolute age by comparing a star's color and brightness with those in stellar evolution models. What did he just say? We look at the model... And we look at the color and the brightness and tell the age of the star. The absolute age. I'm not buying that, Your Honor. Everybody's asking, how did the light get from the star to here? As if that proves the age of the universe. They're asking the wrong question. The Bible says God stretched out the heavens. Seventeen times the Bible says God stretched out the heavens. He made the stars on day four, and then he stretched them out into place. So they're asking the wrong question. How did the light, how did the star get from here to there instead of how did the light get from there to here? Got it completely backwards. Cover one more quick topic here and we'll take a break. What about this red shift? Does that prove the distance and the age of the universe? The displacement of the spectral lines toward longer wavelengths. 
Whoa, what is this? In the radiation from distant galaxies and celestial objects. This is interpreted as Doppler shift that is proportional to the velocity of recession and thus to distance. What are they measuring here? They're measuring black lines that are shifted over to the red, called the red shift. Red shift is a key concept for astronomers. The term can be understood literally. The wavelength of light is stretched, so the light is seen as shifted toward the red part of the spectrum. Something similar happens to sound waves when a source of sound moves relative to an observer. Hmm. So what is red shift? All these downloaded today, some of the articles from a couple years ago. Subtle changes in color of starlight. Let, astronomer, let astronomers find planets and measure the speed of the expansion of the universe. In 1910, astronomers at Lowell University noticed that light from nearly every galaxy was red shifted. And they said, oh, that means the star is moving away. For some reason, most galaxies in the universe were racing away from us. 1929, Edwin Hubble matched up these red shifts with the distance and invented the Big Bang Theory. Since the stars are moving away and they're X number of miles away, that proves they started right here. Isn't it interesting? They all started right here with the Earth, though. How did we end up being the center? That's another story. See, you can take light and send it through a piece of glass and bend it and get the colors out of it. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, you know, a prism. But if you look at the light, you'll see that the red is shifted, the lines are shifted over toward the red, the red shift, they call that. It's the Doppler effect. Let me explain that. If a train is coming toward you, the sound waves are compressed, and it gives it a higher pitch. After it goes past, the sound waves are stretched out, gives it a lower pitch. So you see the train come, it pitch drops, called the Doppler effect. The idea is the same thing can happen with light. I believe that's probably true. So. Obviously, hearing the Doppler effect as a train approaches does not tell me how long the train's been traveling. It can only tell me that it's moving now. So seeing a red shift on a star doesn't tell you it's been doing this for billions of years. You're only seeing it doing it now. If, I see a, if I'm in Pensacola and I see a car on Interstate 10 headed east at 70 miles an hour, does that prove he started in Los Angeles 30 hours ago? You could have got on at the last exit, right? Yeah. Think about that for five minutes. So we're seeing a red shift now, and in giving that an interpretation going back billions of years, scientists bring light to a full stop. Back in 2001, they did this. Harvard, Cambridge, all this stuff, we succeeded in holding a light pulse still. They broke the speed limit 300 times the speed of light. We covered that before. Scientists slow, light down, slow down the speed of light traveling through air. Hmm. Scientists mess with the speed of light. Researchers in Switzerland succeeded in breaking the cosmic speed limit by getting light to go faster than light. Hmm. Scientists make light travel infinitely fast. Now that's fast. Infinitely fast? Light goes backward in time from the Guardian. Back in 2000 they've done this. Speed of light going backwards. The Bible says 17 times God stretched out the heavens. He stretched out the heavens, Isaiah 45. Here's some of the verses that deal with that. If he stretched out the heavens, then you can't use the speed of light to measure the distances to these things. The, a star, a, a light year is a distance. It is a it, it time it takes light to go one year. Or for one year, how far does light travel? So I think we're being sold a bill of goods. They're telling us, the universe began with a big bang, and it's 13 point so many billion light years away, and so many billion years old, all based on a rubber ruler. There are many other ways to show the Earth and universe cannot be billions of years old, but I want you to understand how they got this big number of 13.7 billion, and it really impresses the students. And you can hear it in the teacher's voice when they bring it up. The universe is 13.7 billion years old. Oh, Oscar Shanaha Kawasaki Toyota Honda. That was speaking in tongues, did you hear? Japanese. I think we're being sold a bill of goods. Evolution completely attempts to violate the first law of thermodynamics. Things do not create themselves, and you cannot tell the distance to these stars, and you do not know that light has always gone the same speed, and stop telling the students. The universe is 13.7 billion years old just because a bunch of people believe it. 
The majority of people in North Korea believe Kim Jong-un or whatever his name is, is a wonderful guy. Because if they don't believe that, they shoot him. The majority of Hitler's followers thought Hitler was a great guy. Doesn't mean he was, okay? And just because the majority of people believe something, well, you guys have had the propaganda machine going in our public schools for the last 70 years. You have c captured the majority, probably, of people's minds. It doesn't mean you have the truth. Think about it. If you'd like to have a debate on the topic, give me a call. 855-BIG-DINO, extension 3. We can schedule a Skype debate. We can do one a day, couldn't we, Steve, out there at your place? Yep. Sure, bring it on. Let's do it. Notice, the, notice the smile. Huh? Hugh Ross, come on. Huge loss? Hugh, Hugh Ross? Yeah. I debated him once before. We got it on videotape. Neil deGrasse. His whole presumption is we know the universe is billions of years old. Now, how do we make the Bible say that? Stop. No, you don't know it's billions of years old. It's not. The Bible says about 6,000. And that's plenty of time to accomplish everything, especially when you consider Noah's flood. We'll get into more of that later. Okay, thank you for joining us. Push thumbs up, like us, subscribe, tell your friends, all that kind of stuff, and come visit us at Dinosaur Adventureland and bring a hammer. We got work to do. See you tomorrow. Bye.